Hello and Yali Madad. My name is Kareem Basaria, and I want to thank you for joining me today for an enlightening conversation on this episode of Trailblazers. Dr. Ibu Patel was born in India and raised here in Chicago. Ibu is the founder of Interfaith Youth Corps, a Chicago-based organization building the interfaith movement on college campuses and beyond. Ibu served on President Barack Obama's inaugural advisory council of the White House Office of Faith-Based and Neighborhood Partnerships. An author of four books with a fifth on the way, Ibu holds a doctorate in the sociology of religion from Oxford University, where he studied on a Rhodes Scholarship. He's a regular contributor to the Washington Post, USA Today, the Chicago Tribune, NPR, and CNN. Ibu has over 20 years of experience working with governments, social sector organizations, and college and university campuses to help realize a future where religion is a bridge of cooperation rather than a barrier of division. One of the things on this issue that, that I found interesting was that you almost have to walk through the basic history, not only of your own time, right. but the basic history uh, of the Muslim world and the divisions within it, right. to the Parliament of Canada. <laughs> I mean, when we talk about the, you know, the clash of ignorance. Right. Well, that's it. But it, I mean, that's it. It's that basic, though. It's that, that basic. And when we talked uh, some years ago, uh, I said to you, one of our biggest problems in the Islamic world is that we are absent from Western culture. We don't exist. Now that's changing, but it's changing very, very slowly. Very, very slowly. In my view, much too slowly. And I'm not sure I understand why it's changing so slowly. But much of what I said today to, to, to the Parliament is so basic that it could be part of general education around the world, simply so that communities, countries understand what are the dynamic forces in those societies. It's not new. It's been there a long, long time. Ibu, thank you for being here today and for sharing your insights with Trailblazers. Uh, I'm grateful to have your time here, and I'm excited that we get to share this conversation with our viewers. Well, thank you for having me. I'm inspired to be here, and I appreciate the time you've all put into setting this up. I want to start with a somewhat broad question. Uh, religions share certain values, compassion, mercy, generosity. Your life's work is focused on pluralism. Can you tell our audience a little bit about journey and what inspired you to do this work? Sure. So in so many ways, my journey starts in my family, which is an Ismaili family, which always put service first and always talked about the importance of tolerance and pluralism. And so I was kind of formed in that environment. And then when I went to college, I got very involved in diversity work and in social justice work. And at some point, I connected it with my own faith background. And I realized that the values that I was applying in college really came from my family and from the Ismaili faith. Went on to grad school, and I did a doctorate in the sociology of religion studying uh, Ismaili religious education. And I began to get more uh, steeped in the imam's writings and speeches about pluralism and realized just how important it was in Ismaili theology and decided that I really wanted my life's work to be about this, but I wanted it to be about the applied dimensions of pluralism. So while I've written a number of books on pluralism, what I'm really about is working with college students and young adults to be interfaith leaders, to be the kind of people with the vision, the knowledge base, and the skill set to build spaces of pluralism and to build bridges between people from different religious backgrounds. And when you talk about building spaces, I've, I've heard you make the, the very simple but powerful and important point that diversity is not just the differences we like, and that engaging in interfaith cooperation includes engaging on differences that we might initially be uncomfortable with. Can you share a personal experience where 
you found that kind of engagement um, uncomfortable at first and, and, and how you worked through that? Sure. So it, it's maybe my best line in 10 years that, uh, that you took from me. Uh, diversity is not just the differences that you like. Uh, so I, f I go to college campuses all the time, and I find myself on uh, uh, ca campuses that are Catholic and uh, Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, Mormon, and Evangelical, and there are a set of doctrinal beliefs within those traditions that I disagree with, uh, that we as Smileys disagree with theologically. And of course, there's a set of uh, dimensions of, of us, for example, Sunni Muslim belief that Ismailis are not entirely consonant with. And to do the work of diversity is to recognize that you're going to disagree on some fundamental things that really matter to you, like doctrine, and that you're going to get to work together on other fundamental things. And so I think of a hospital as the best example of this in action. So you've got doctors and nurses and respiratory therapists and custodians and secretarial staff and researchers from all different religious backgrounds, from atheist to Zoroastrian. And they have different ideas of why we were born and what happens to us after we die. But there they are working together in a hospital, each of them inspired by their own religious or ethical tradition to heal other people. And I think that's just the most inspiring thing in the world, that a Catholic doctor and a Jewish doctor and a Muslim respiratory therapist uh, working with a Jehovah's Witness uh, who has sanitized the room to do a heart transplant, right? Again, different doctrines, different stories of creation, different definitions of salvation, and yet here they are all working together to save a life. That's interfaith cooperation. I, I like this example of the hospital because and, you, and you've used a, a, a term, uh, the civic interfaith landscape, um, to describe certain spaces. Can you expand on, on what you mean by the civic inter, interfaith landscape? And, and why is it important for Ismaili Muslims to be a part of that landscape as interfaith leaders? Sure. So uh, whatever space we might go to, a museum, a school, a hospital, a library, basically anything but a Jamaat Khanna, right? Uh, or, any th uh, or, or any space that's not in a smiley specific space, we are going to encounter people from a range of different religious orientations. They may be secular humanists, they may be Sunni Muslims, they may be Ethnosharis, they may be Zoroastrian, they may be Catholic, they may be evangelical, they may be Jewish. The question is, do we have the ability to recognize those interestingly diverse religious orientations, to see the significance of them? So if you're in a hospital, there are different religious practices that occur when a baby is born and when a person dies. In fact, different religions have different definitions of death, right? If you are part of a sports team where people have different religious rituals, uh, different times of fasting, different times of prayer, do you, do you have the leadership ability to be a part of that civic religious interfaith landscape, right? It's kind of an academic phrase to say that any space that we are likely to be in is going to be religiously diverse. And we can either, in, we can either encourage that religious diversity to be defined by bridges of cooperation or by barriers of division. And interfaith leaders are constantly looking to build bridges of cooperation. You, you've, uh, we, when you talk about interfaith cooperation, you've, you've used this phrase, and I, I think it's beautiful, the waters of interfaith work often take on the colors of the rocks over which they flow. Um, can you tell us what you mean by that and, and how coming from the Ismaili tradition um, has colored uh, the way you approach interfaith work and interfaith leadership. Sure. So, so that line, like so many of my best lines, is actually an adaptation of somebody else's line. So that's uh, uh, the, the great Islamic scholar uh, uh, who lives in the Chicagoland area, actually, Dr. Umar Farouk Abdullah. He says that the waters of Islam are so pure that they take on the colors of the rocks over which they flow. And when I heard that, I thought to myself, there is an that there is a, an Ismailiness to that line. Maulana Hazri Imam you know, will point out that, that, that mosques in China look different than mosques in Saudi Arabia because Chinese architecture is different than, than architecture in the Middle East. And that is beautiful, and it's part of 
the pluralism of Islam, right? You have an essence that takes on different expression. So I think that that's, that is also true of interfaith work. Uh, interfaith work is likely to look different in India than it is to look in the United States. My grandmother, the great Ashraf Maji, as she is known, did a different kind of interfaith work. It was very personal. It was with women in her own home than I do, which is the building of an institution that works in, uh, in a networked way across U.S. campuses. What's the kind of culture, uh, uh, what, what is the expression that you might give to interfaith work? It might be different for uh, in different countries, in different age groups, for different genders. And I would just encourage the building of the building the bridges of cooperation in the way that you see fit, whatever your situation is and whatever your social position is. Do you do you see differences in the way those bridges are built across college campuses within the United States? Also, that's a great question. So, so I, I will say that one of the reasons I started an organization that was initially called Interfaith Youth Corps, and now our work has, has expanded a lot beyond young people. We we refer to it as IFYC more often now is because I got involved in interfaith work when I was 24 or 25, uh, um, right about the time I was going to do my doctorate on Ismaili religious education. And the conferences that I went to were dominated by older white people, typically theologians, and typically the methodology was keynote speeches and panels. And I was a 25-year-old with my hair on fire, and that was boring to me. And I thought to myself, interfaith work should take the form of service. That's what inspired me about the Ismaili faith, my own faith, and that's what inspired me about other faiths. And so, in effect, the, the, the colors of, the, of my own rocks at the time were service initiatives, and that's what I wanted interfaith work to take, that, that expression. Now, over time, uh, IFYC has given many different expressions to interfaith work. We do major research studies. We do trainings. We develop course sequences. We work with administrations on strategic plans. We do a range of types of things. Increasingly, we're working with foundations and with companies on interfaith work, right? But at 25, at this conference at Stanford University, the expression I wanted to give to interfaith work was service. There's ways to do interfaith work that's theological in nature, where you're sitting around and studying scripture. There's ways to do it that, that uh, um, uh, would center women's groups. There's ways to do it that's around development projects. Whatever way you can bridge the divides between different religious traditions and build cooperation, I say go for it. You know, one of the things that's that's so exciting, but but frankly also terrifying about this point in human history is we've never been here before, right? The, the world has never built a multi-ethnic, multicultural, religiously diverse democracy. What what have you learned over the last few years? Not not just from what you see in American politics, but from events around the world on the path and the challenges to building a, a lasting, religiously diverse democracy? That it's, it, uh, that's another great question, Kareem, and I, I would say that uh, nothing is ordained, right? Outside, outside of what God ordains uh, in, in his own way, when I was, you know, during the Obama years in which I was so inspired and, and involved in a small way as a member of President Obama's inaugural faith council, I, I thought that, to use a geeky academic term, this was, this was part of the, the arc of the universe. It was, it, was, it was, we were taking a step towards the end point of a truly diverse democracy, right? And in 2016, that takes a very different turn. And I realized that, that the Obama years wasn't a step down a, a preordained path towards a a better diverse democracy, it was a powerful moment in time that we need to continue to build from that we can't take for granted. So I would say that the single biggest lesson learned is nothing just happens in the universe outside of what God chooses. We make things happen, right? God makes us his abd and halifa, his servant and representative. We are the stewards of creation. Bridges don't fall from the sky. They don't rise from the ground. People build them. And democracy is work. Institution building is work. 
We as Smileys know that as well as anybody because of the way that, that Molana Hazra Imam has guided us to build institutions. It's work, it's meetings, it's events, it's a constant stitching of a fabric of a religious community. Well, democracy is even more delicate than that because you have many communities that are stitching a fabric together, right? And so it just, it is constant, constant work. But it's blessed work, it's holy work, it's sacred work, it's worth doing. That's also a, a very inspiring way to describe it, right? Because it, this, the, the idea that, you know, we're on this train and its direction is not preordained. Yeah. You know, it, it's, it's motivating. Um, I, I find those words very, very inspiring, very motivating. Um, you, you have talked about the importance of creating spaces where it's easier for people to cooperate. What, what is it about interfaith cooperation that is so powerful in helping create those spaces compared to cooperation that's based on something other than religious identity? So I think all kinds of cooperation are good, right? Um, I think, so I think the key ingredient to interfaith cooperation is a focused activity which is one of the reasons hospitals are such inspiring and powerful places. There's a focused activity. You treat the patients who come in the door, right? There is a larger purpose, which is healing and well-being. And there's a set of focused activities, which is you treat the patients who come in the door. And that provides a, a, a focus, there's no better word for it, for the people with different cosmic visions right? Athletics is another great example. There's a very focused activity for the Hindus and Muslims that are on, you know, the India cricket team, for example, or the Muslims and Christians that are on any NBA team, right? You have to have a focused activity where you can bring the depth of your religious identity. So, so many of our religious traditions speak about the importance of healing, speak about the importance of well-being, speak about the importance of, in the language of Islam, being a mercy upon all the worlds. So absolutely, Muslim doctors walk into uh, an emergency room thinking that they, their activity is a living out of their faith. Catholic doctors and Jewish doctors and indeed secular humanist doctors would feel the same way when it comes to their ethics. And so this combination of a focused activity for a diverse group of people to come together and do that allows them to connect the depth and beauty of their religious tradition to that activity and therefore to the other people who are involved in the endeavor. I, I wanna ask you a personal question. Um, your wife, like mine, uh, is Muslim but not Ismaili, and your kids attended Catholic preschool. H how have those aspects of your personal life shaped um, your journey as an interfaith leader? Yeah, it's a great question. So, so I think for all kinds of reasons, uh, many of them personal, I'm just constantly looking for the area of overlap. I'm, I am not looking for the area of dissonance or division. I've kind of trained myself to look for the areas of resonance and commonality. And I do that in, uh, in my marriage with my wife. I do that, you know, when we send our kids to Catholic schools, we're constantly focusing on uh, um, what Islam and Catholicism have in common. Now, we're not stupid about the areas of difference, and sometimes there is a very interesting creative tension. So, for example, Easter and Holy Week in a Catholic school is obviously taken quite seriously, and we Muslims view it differently than Catholics do. We don't believe that Jesus was crucified, and therefore we don't believe in the resurrection in the same way, right? So that's a doctrinal point that's important. It's different than a, what a Catholic school thinks. And we would make that point to our kids, even when they were five. But in making that point, we would talk about love for the prophet Isa. We'd talk about how we believed in his cosmicness, how he brought the message of Allah, of mercy and monotheism, right? So I'm constantly looking for the areas of overlap, the areas of commonality, the areas of resonance, but, but not in a simplistic way, uh, in, in a way that recognizes difference, even disagreement, but, but doesn't 
allow those differences to turn into divisions and doesn't allow those differences to prevent cooperation, right? Um, I just think that how, how else are you going to have a family right. or a diverse democracy right. unless you think that the areas of commonality and the possibilities of cooperation are inspiring and worth working at, right? I mean, that's, it is work. The question is, do you, you decide if it's worth it? I, I want to go back to something you said earlier. You, you referred to the, to the geeky academic phrase, um, bending the arc uh, of the universe toward justice. And you've, you've talked about how interfaith work has done that around the world. Um, how, how does your faith, uh, our faith, uh, uh, impact or influence your approach to uh, issues like environmental justice or social justice movements like Black Lives Matter, which, which a lot of young people in our Jamaat are very, very focused on. Yeah. So I would say that I began my work in social change as an activist, and I've wound up as a civic leader and an institution builder. And I'll actually tell you uh, kind of the creation story of that. So. Uh, a lot of my time in college was spent in demonstrations and with my fist in the air denouncing the bad things around me. And I would say for the first couple of years after college, I was much the same way, including at interfaith conferences, as I kind of alluded to earlier. I'd go to these conferences when I was in my early 20s, and it was a lot of old white people talking on panels, and it was boring. And, and I always thought religion should be inspiring and not boring, right? And I would stand up and you know, do the kind of metaphorical equivalent of put my fin fist in the air and say, you're too homogenous and it's too boring and there needs to be more young people and there needs to be more social action and more edginess. And at one of these conferences in June of 1998, a woman, a Mayan woman named Yolan Trevino walked up to me and said, you know, what you're saying, this idea of of uh, interfaith work should be young people from different religions taking action. That's really inspiring. You should build that. And in a lot of ways, like, that's my second life. That's the beginning of my second life. Because up until that point, I'd been a denouncer. I would pointed out things that other people were doing wrong. And there's, there's never going to be an end to what other people are doing wrong. But what happens when somebody invites you to build something better, right? That's a different kind of work, and it's a lot harder. It's a lot harder. So there needs to be people who clear the space, who say this is wrong and it needs to stop, like racist policing. That needs to stop. How you build institutions of public safety that protect people and respect and preserve their dignity, that is a different kind of challenge than denouncing racist policing. And I have become the kind of person who does a lot less denouncing and a lot more building. And I think actually, um, deep in my subconscious, there is kind of an Ismaili theology at work. Right? If you look at what Molana Hazri Mom has done, you find an awful lot of building. You find an awful lot of institutions. You do not find that many denouncements. Interesting. You know, the, the, your, your work here in, in the U.S., the, the U.S. is still uh, one of the most, if not the most, religious Western democracies. But you know, over the last several years, the percentage of Americans, and in particular young Americans, who aren't affiliated with any religion, uh, continues to grow. Uh, what challenges or opportunities have you found in that shift um, in your work? So, you know, IFYC does a lot of work with college students, and so something like a third of college students say that they're not religious. And IFYC has always been an atheist to Zoroastrian organization. We've always been an organization where people from who, who don't have a professed religion have an equal seat at the table. And part of this is because 18, 19, 20-year-olds are on a journey, right? And, and they're, they're uh, 
figuring out their identity in relationship to how they grew up and in a relationship to who they're going to be as adults. And we're open to that, right? But part of what you just did, which is, is you disaggregated the data by age. Let's disaggregate it by race. So the percentage of white Americans who say that they have a strong resonance with their faith is 49%. Percentage of Latino Americans, 59%. Percentage of African Americans, 75%. So when people talk about uh, the United States increasingly secularizing, I'm like, maybe white folks, not all folks, right? So let's let's be careful to not have an overlay of whiteness over a very mm -hmm. complex racial landscape. And the vast majority of African Americans and an appreciable majority of Latino Americans have deep identity with their faiths. So, so Ibu, to, to close us off, can you share a personal or inspiring story um, that has really sort of defined uh, your direction? I know you, you shared a couple, uh, but if you could share another story with our viewers, I'm sure you have plenty. Sure. So uh, when I was... Uh, when I was in South Africa in 1999, I saw Mandela speak. And Mandela began his talk by pointing out to the Cape, towards Robben Island, where he spent 27 years of his life in prison. And he said, I would still be there if it wasn't for the Christians and the Muslims, the Jews and the Hindus, the Buddhists and the Baha'is, and the African traditionalists and the secular humanists of South Africa coming together in the movement against apartheid and in the movement to build the rainbow nation of South Africa. And I think that that was a moment when I realized just how powerful interfaith cooperation can be and that I wanted to be a part of extending that work into the 21st century. It's very inspiring. And, it, and it's also a, a place that you know, is very diverse and had to work through a lot of tension um, and hostility to, to come out where it was when, when you were there, I guess. Right. You know, um, uh, the great Vincent Harding, who was a... a um, a companion of Martin Luther King Jr.'s and uh, who wrote his, his Vietnam speech that he gave in 1967, he would say, I live in a nation that does not yet exist. And I love that, right? So, so it's not a denouncement, yeah. but it's not an acceptance. Right. It's a pointing to the future and it's a, a suggestion we have a responsibility of building it, right? I live in a nation that does not yet exist. That is beautiful. Um, Ibu, thank, this has been terrific. Thank you so much for being here. We, we appreciate your time. Um, it's been a, a great conversation, and I'm, I'm looking forward to you know, being able to, to share it with everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to Smiley TV. Thank you to everybody who's done work on this. It's a, it's a beautiful collaboration. I'm really honored that you chose me for this. And, and you know, we as Smiley's, we are interfaith leaders in our core, in our, in our theology, and, and I hope that this interview inspires people to be interfaith leaders in their actions and in their lives. We are citizens of a country that we still have to create. A just country, a compassionate country, a forgiving country, a multiracial, multireligious country a joyful country that cares about its children and about its elders, that cares about itself and about the world, that cares about what the earth needs as well as what individual people need. I am, you are a citizen of a country that does not yet exist and that badly needs to exist. Actually, really important things happen when people from different religious traditions, including no religion at all, atheists and agnostics and seekers, when all of us partner together, that's when we have the opportunity to achieve what we at Interfaith Youth Corps call pluralism, which is respect for different identities, relationships between different communities, and a positive contribution and commitment to the common good.